Hi, I'm Ethan, and I love muzzleloading. Today, we're talking with John DeWald. John is a longtime muzzleloading enthusiast, living historian, and... Hi, I'm Ethan, an ILO maker. We're going to talk to him about his history in muzzleloading, how he got his start, a lot of the people that helped him along the way and worked with him along the way to get him to where he is today. We're also going to talk about the Gunmakers Fair at Kempton, which is a rebirth of the Gunmakers Fair at Dixon's. It's a continuation and evolution of a great event. If you're listening to this on the week of July 25th, 2022, this coming weekend is going to be the first weekend for the Gunmakers Fair at Kempton. I'm excited to be there. We're going to talk to John about the details of the Gunmakers Fair, see if it's the kind of thing you might be interested in. We're also going to talk about what it took to bring this event to life. So if you're interested in what it takes to run a muzzleting event or want to learn a little bit more about the kind of work that goes into this, you're going to want to listen to this and uh, and hear what John has to say about the work he's done and the work his great team has done to keep this great tradition going. John, thank you very much for coming onto the show. Oh, Ethan, I'm so glad to be here. Um, and I, I'm been a native of northeastern pennsylvania for my entire life with you know little trips out of the country for military and training and whatnot but uh you know over 42 years ago i mean i think i was 12 well i was seven years old my dad and i went to a campground out 118 in pennsylvania i think it was called happy valley campground and there was a group of guys from um the danville sportsman's club that were doing a black powder and tomahawk and knife demonstration there and uh, my dad and I went to see that, and we were both hooked. We became members of that club, members of Whisper and Pines, and, and I lived the muzzleloading lifestyle all of my young life up, up until I went to the military. To include, at 12 years old, um, my dad convinced me to engrave a powder horn. Um, it was actually just a small piece of cow horn, and I engraved a, a mountain lion sitting on a branch. And I was hooked, and I've been engraving now for 42 years. Uh, been involved with, uh, I mentioned two clubs. I've also been involved with the NMLRA, KRA, KRF, uh, the CLA, and I just finished my tenure as Guildmaster with the Honorable Company of Horners. Uh, I've also, since 2004, done French Indian War reenactments and traveled pretty much everywhere that one took place for all the 250th events, and I have completely become consumed by this lifestyle for for many, many years, especially this craft that I do. Um, I do research. I, I tinker away in my workshop just about every day. I'm retired now, so I, I can do that as much as I want. Uh, I do both contemporary historical work, uh, powder horns, spice boxes, wing bone turkey calls, accoutrements horn, from horn and wood. Uh, amongst all that, you know, I, I got married. I'm, uh, this, this September, I'll be 23 years with my beautiful wife and my 20-year-old daughter. And uh, we enjoy hunting, fishing, and going to the events together whenever we can. Man, you've done just about everything. Well, and and there's but there's so much more, and that's what's so great about this culture is you know there's there's been so many people to promote it and carry it through. And my my daughter loves this culture and does not like being at college. She would much more be involved. And I and I think that brings me to a tagline that I use pretty much all the time whenever I write and you know at some point my ashes will return to mother earth and I would like somebody to pick up a piece of my work as same as they would you know as like the Williams Williams horn or Lake George Carver you know from 250 years ago and say hey that's a DeWald piece to me it's a preservation of a dying art kept alive through caring hands and that that to me is a legacy to leave for my daughter that's wonderful it's interesting because muzzleloading and the culture of, of traditional American crafts, it keeps itself going with that kind of sentiment because everybody that's involved in it, no matter how deep you are into it, you are working to, to read and understand this archaic, you know, thing that doesn't, isn't really necessarily relevant anymore, apart from historical study and, and appreciation of the art form. And so each time that you're doing any aspect of this, you yourself are preserving it and keeping it going. You never know if you're going to be talking to somebody down the road and, and they're, you're going to be able to hand it off to them and then they're going to pick it up and, and keep it going and just keep transferring that down through history. Oh, absolutely. That's one of the greatest things I love about this. And, you know, I, I find as I progress too, I mean, my interests now are far different than they were when I started in this. Um, you know, the, the mission of the Honorable Company of Horners is the pre education, preservation and research of horn work. And the, 
the more years that go by, the more becomes available to understand the story that, that's not from a verbal word, but it's literally pieces of history that are laid on a table for you to look at and for you to draw from and pay it forward. Yeah. You know, I, I remember a time uh, when I was working with Bill Kennedy down in Muncie in a shop and we were trying to figure out how to how to dye a powder horn, how, how to do this color that everybody was doing. And back then, nobody really liked to share that. But now I, I find that sharing that widens the scope of knowledge and brings more people into the fold to continue this for future generations. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. There's something really neat about the time that we're living in, and I'm sure people are, are sick of me talking about it, but we live in a time where if I can't get hands on with an original piece, I can find a ton of information about that piece online, either through private collections that are share information or through museums. We saw during COVID, a ton of museums put their collections online and, and to be digitally accessible, I think, unlike ever before. And then I can, I can then talk to people like you and, and your contemporaries that are working to create and recreate these things using traditional processes. So I can follow it from the piece that exists today and I can study that and then I can work with and talk to people that are working to deconstruct that and understand how it was made. That, that's And that's the beauty of it. For every, for every aspect of, of modern technology that people don't like, there's there's such a good side to it as well that, that has brought that forward. Uh, when I recreated the Williams-Williams horn, uh, it was done by John Bush during the French and Indian War. Uh, I actually contacted Deerfield Museum where the horn resides and was, was able to not only have hands-on, but, you know, I had access to all their photographs online and was able to recreate that horn 100% exactly the way it was. You know, the the, the market, too, for, for raw horns is available through many different people now, not just one or two people. So it's it, to me, that, that does draw, you know, it draws people in uh, through social media and, and through the internet to actually keep this alive as well. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, you started with this black powder club when you were younger with your, with your father and he got you into, or, or, or kind of pushed you a little bit to start engraving on a horn. What led, you know, what came in between that, you know, as, as a young kid, it, it's easy to, to do the things our parents want us to do because we don't really have much of a choice, but what kept you involved as a young adult? And then through having your own kids and, and starting your family, I mean, I'm really finding that out now is life gets very busy once you have a kid, which is really great because you're going through all those experiences, but I can, I can really understand how people get in and out of the community or the hobby as they're doing that. So what did that look like for you to go from making or carving on your first piece of horn at, at age 12 to recreating and, and what made you want to recreate those original pieces like you're doing now? Oh gosh. I mean, that's quite a span of time. Um, when I graduated high school, I joined the military and ultimately ended up in Germany and uh, while I was there, I, I think this fantastic muzzleloading culture, the, the family that 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 I developed would send me audio tapes back then, you know, cassette tapes to listen to. And I, I think that kept me involved there. And I also found a uh, a, a local group in Baumholder, Germany, that were uh, French and Indian War reenactors. And oh, really? And several of their events. Yeah. So my mother and father put together like a care package for me, and it was it was my uh, muzzleloading regalia and sent it over to me so that I could dress and go to a couple of these events. So that that really kept me um, involved, you know, while I was gone. Uh, when I came home from the military, um, a very good friend of mine uh, that married my sister uh, said, John, I, I have an, an idea how we can stay more involved in this. And that was uh, French Indian War reenacting. Um, I had a pretty rough kit back then. It, it, it wasn't what people would call period correct, but it, it was passable. And I went to uh, Bushy Run Battlefield in 2004 and took part in a reenactment there. And when you come through those trees and you see all of these reenactors there together recreating this, you know, specific moment in history, it's it's like the present day and time didn't exist anymore. Yeah. And that that was just such a huge thing for me. I've loved history my whole life. I had a great history teacher, I think, is where it started. But uh, 
I found that I didn't, I was borrowing equipment. So that's another thing that kept me involved. I decided that I was going to get back into horn work and make myself a horn to carry at these events. Um, Several years later, in 2007, I was at Fort Frederick, which I've gone to Fort Frederick many, many times throughout my life, Fort Frederick Market Fair. And at the time, I was not a sutler. Uh, I was just a camper. We were camped down in the bottom. And Bill Kennedy's uh, uh, widow and his daughter, uh, Kim, came down to see us at the camp. And she asked if I was still doing horn work. And I was so excited. I ran in the tent and I got the horn that I had made for reenacting. I brought it out and showed it to her. And, oh. and I said, but why do you ask? And she's like, because Bill had passed at this point. And she said, I would like you to make a family horn to hang with my dad's guns. Wow. Which, you know, it that to me, that, that was a very poignant moment for me all the time that I had spent in his shop learning how to pre-carve stocks and inlet and do all this fantastic work on guns, you know, 18th century guns. Yeah. So we, we put together a horn and in, um, 2007, I believe it was 2009, actually, uh, I w w wanted to, to get it right. So I found a, a little group on the internet called the Horner's Bench. And there was a whole bunch of people in there offering great advice and telling me, you know, what to look for here and how to do this and how to really improve myself. And one guy contacted me personally, and I will mention him because I, I owe him that. Gary Elsenbeck contacted me personally and uh, said, John, you should look up the Honorable Company of Horners. So I did. And that in 2009, I attended my first Honorable Company Horners meeting at Fort Roberto near Altoona, Pennsylvania. And the ribbon er, and the horn that I had made for, for Kim to hang with her dad's guns won a ribbon. Wow. And it wasn't a first place, but it was a third place ribbon. And while I was there, I'd never worn 18th century civilian clothing. I'd always dress as a native or a mountain man. Mm -hmm. So I made my first set of clothing to go to this show. Uh, there were sitting everybody that I'd looked up to, even as a kid, you know, there's, there's art to camp and there's Willie Frankfurt and, you know, Herb Shantz and Roland Cato and Frank Willis, all these people that I knew about from this culture and they were doing hands-on instruction. And it was at that Fort Roberto that I was standing in front of Herb Shantz at the lathe. And finally he looks up and asks if I was ready to get my clothes dirty. And I didn't know you could turn horn on a lathe. I didn't know anything about that. So that, pushed me even further into this. And when I came home, uh, the following day, I went down to my shop and I created a, a, a full cart cup with a stag on it and a box with the joiner die on it, very small items. And then, uh, I, once they were done, I showed my wife, I was so proud and I, I decided to engrave the cup and I made my own ink to do that. I just kept, it just kept snowballing into something bigger and bigger and bigger. And then finally, Celinda calls me and says, uh, I saw, I, I gave the, the horn to Kim as a, as a birthday gift. She took it home, showed her mom, called me immediately and says, I'm doing a show at the Muncie Fire Hall. Bring everything that you've made and come to the fire hall. And we put it on the table and she started introducing me to this whole new aspect of the culture that I never knew about. I just thought it was reenactments and rendezvous. Mm -hmm. No, here's, here's market fairs and here, you know, indoor shows. And she took me uh, to the CLA show. She took me to various other shows. I did the Muncie Historical Art Show for years. And again, it just it kept snowballing. Finally, I go back to Dixon's. I hadn't been there in a couple of years. And I enter my cup and my box and a compass in the competition. And my cup won a judge's choice ribbon and actually spawned a, uh, a very long and drawn out conversation about folk art culture and what was considered such so I, hmm. it impacted me so greatly that it i i just needed to do more and more and long story short i ended up becoming the killed master of the honorable company of orders that's wonderful i mean that's just that's the kind of story that i love to hear about because it's just it's representative of of the people of the community and it's representative of, of one of about a million avenues that you can go down depending oh, on your interests. 
and it, it even snowballed from there. You know, just a couple of years after I won the ribbon on the cup, um, Tom Ames, who I've respected ever since I was a young lad, um, he, you know, he was the head of the uh, accoutrements judging at, at, at the, the, uh, gunmakers fair at Dixon's muzzleloading shop. Mm-hmm. And he invited me to, uh, participate on the judges panel for the accoutrements. And I've been on it ever since which again, opened up a whole new realm of history and understanding and knowledge that I didn't know existed. Um, because we have a chance to actually hold all of these items that numerous people from across the state, across, you know, not just the United States, there's people that come from England and New Zealand to, to, to go to that show. And, you know, I, 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 I just, you get to hold them and you, you get to look at each individual person's influence on that culture and you get to write about it in a positive way. That sounds wonderful. Yeah, to me, that's that's the ultimate pay it forward, you know, to to encourage somebody who's already doing that to go further. Yeah, that's it's really interesting. You're kind of filling one of the roles that helped you go along your way. You know, it's very yeah. kind of you to do that and to, to give back to the community. Thank you. So do you still do you still do any shooting or hunting or is it is it primarily the accoutrements now? Uh, it's primarily the accoutrements now that I'm retired. I've, uh, I've, I've dusted off the Fowler and the, and the 58 cal or it's a 54 caliber, a uh, Hawk and my dad and I built together. And, um, I do want to get another custom piece made and I, I would like to shoot more. I, I miss going to Indiana from, I, I used to go out there with Bill when I was a kid, I shot there, I shot at Blue Ridge, Whispering Pines. I, I love the competition shooting. Um, it, it is. It is right now very expensive to do so, but it, it's still something that I, I would like to reinvigorate. I still muzzleloader hunt. Um, I small game hunt with a black powder shotgun. You know, mm-hmm. it, it, it just, it doesn't go away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it, it's, uh, for me at least, I find that there are times where I can go out and shoot, but the times that I can be reading or researching or making accoutrements are a little more accessible. Mm-hmm. You know, I yes. can, I can do that while I'm sitting on the couch, you know, spending some time with the family, right? you know, or I have 15 minutes here or there. It's, it's hard to get my muzzleloader out to, to go take a couple of shots and then clean it, you know, for as long as I was shooting. <laughs> right. Well, and, and I, and I do have to say too, that, you know, it, paying it forward is great and I appreciate the compliment, but I wouldn't be who I am without all those people that came before me. Those, those wonderful people who, you know, took a chance on, on, somebody just to just to keep the culture alive you know Um, even my even my high school art teacher Nella Storm if it was not for her my love of art probably wouldn't be as passionate as it is today and I end up many many years later you know uh, making a powder horn for her husband for their 42nd wedding anniversary you know so I I owe them as much as anybody would ever owe me I don't want to take all that credit no yeah yeah of course yeah at the, at, I've been thinking about this a lot, and it, it's not necessarily specific to muzzleloading and the, the associated traditional crafts, but there's a, a culture here in this community, wherever you're at, I, I would argue that you can find it if you can find the people that are doing this. But because it is is so associated with the the country itself and and was this is the stuff that was there at the beginning and before it, the country began but i think it's one of the oldest cultural connections we have to each other and to history and oh absolutely there's there's just something there i haven't quite been able to put words to it so i'm trying to find it as i'm thinking about it but there's just something there that allows us all to be so connected and and work with each other to to continue it and and connect with the people i don't know there's just a there's a great friendship and there's a great bond with it all um, the, the camaraderie of each individual that is involved in this culture yeah complements one another yes. I, I i i've never had to lock anything up at an event uh i've never had to search very far for for a friendly hand if you need help carrying water or firewood you know i i think I think the more we focus on on the absolute historical aspect of what we're doing, the less room there is, you know, for us to be at odds with each other. Yeah. I, I just I, I think it's a melding of of history into the modern world that you won't find anywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Like I 
I enjoy going out and shooting, but more and more I'm enjoying talking with people and, and, you know, like just hearing your story and, and hearing about all the people that helped you get to where you're at. And then hearing about the people that you're helping. And it's just, it's just super neat. Like those stories are just, I just love them. And I, I, I really appreciate you sharing it with me. I, I get a little excited about it because it's just, it's just super neat. But on, on one hand, it, it's fun to take a 200 year old ignition system and figure out how to make it shoot accurately. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you know, and, and what a beauty every once in a while you come across an original piece. It's still in firing condition and you're able to do that. Yeah. You know, I remember as a young lad, my uh, trade sessions, you know, where you get together and trade for items. My dad ended up making a trade for a, a single barrel percussion shotgun. And I actually shot trap with it up. It was from Pines that weekend. And we bring it home. We start cleaning up. We find out it's an original barrel. It's an original piece. The only thing that had been changed was the lock. Wow. And there's a silver wedding band. on. Needless to say, I didn't get to shoot that much anymore. But <laughs> I, I can actually say I shot an original gun. You know? And to hold 250-year-old powder horns with the canvas still as bright as it was when they made it. You know? Yeah. You just you, – you, you, don't, you don't get that. I mean, there, there's there's other – there's other things, original artworks, original furniture, original, but it's all historical. And that's, I guess that's where we're, we're basing this. Yeah. You know? Let's, let's jump over to the Hawken real quick that you and your father built. Tell me a little bit about yeah. that. When was that? What kind of Hawken was it? And, and how did that go? Because I know I've done a lot of things with my dad too. And, you know, sometimes it goes well. And sometimes there's a little bit of, <laughs> of hair pulling out with something like that. So my dad uh, had gotten together with Bill Kennedy to find parts and I, it's a, it's a Siler lock. I, I'm not sure where the stock came from. It's a green mountain barrel. Um, it, it's kind of a unique hawk and it, it's the basic hawk in shape, but it has a, a full wooden rib of, underneath the barrel instead of the metal rib. My dad wanted to keep it kind of plain. Okay. And it's not, it's not finely sanded and carved. It's, it's what two guys in a workshop would have got together and, and built, and I, th I think I was maybe about 13 or 14 years old when, when we built it. And I, I didn't really have my hands into it as much as my father did, but I, I helped and learned along the way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, I, I n never had a chance to hunt with that gun. Uh, again, like I said, I just got it out and dusted it off. I plan on using it this year. Um, my dad had asked me this past year, you know, he says, John, I'm, I'm, I'm getting up there in age and, and I want to know if there's anything you would like. And I said, do you still have the Hawking gun that we built? And he's like, yes. And it's yours. So it's, it's, to me, that's that, that's also something historically that happened in his culture is, you know, it didn't just go to a, a warehouse and it doesn't go to a museum all the time. It's a family heirloom and it always will be. Yeah. You know, and so it, it I, what kind of style? Um, I would say your typical uh, pre eighteen forty hawk and gun that you would find in a trading post on a frontier. That that's that's what I, you know, compare it to. That's awesome. Not to date you or, or age you with that. Was was that around kind of the mountain man? resurgence or, or what what era are we kind of looking at there because i'm i'm always trying to, i'm always interested in how movies like jeremiah johnson accelerated oh, things so so the movie the, the movie the mountain man you know charlton has some yeah. so we built this gun after that movie okay um jeremiah johnson i mean that just you know catapult things so yeah this was definitely during the rendezvous mountain man era surge that was taking place I mean, local gun clubs were having great rendezvous then. Uh, you could barely find a camping space back then, hmm. you know. And my dad also, because of all that, got into, uh, he converted half of it when, oh gosh, what was it, Roush's, Roush's gun shop, muzzleloading gun shop, I think back in the day. And uh, he had passed away and they were getting ready to sell everything. And my dad bought most of the inventory, converted half of his two-car garage into Northeast Trade Company. Oh, really? And um, I came home from the military, worked the printing business till we decided that it wasn't really feasible to do that anymore because he was, you know, it was more lucrative for him to have a muzzle loading store. So he, he took the rest of the garage over and has now expanded that, has a machine shop, Northeast Trade Company. He's been there for years and years and years. And he's, he's you know, been involved in this culture longer than I have. 
Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, it, it's just it, it's 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 amazing how it progressed. You know. Yeah. But that but that gun definitely came out of all of that. You know, and, and it, it to me it's a it's one of the iconic pieces from my childhood that you know makes me want to hold on to this even more. Yeah, I think when you're able to get exposed to it as a kid, it it becomes more important as you age because it's it's a way to not only connect with, you know, American history and American culture, but your own family mm-hmm. history and and your your fam, you know. That's really just wonderful. I love that it it wasn't just you know, building a Hawken, it became running a business and a business that's still going. Like you're combining right. American history with, you know, American business sense of starting something in your garage and, and growing it and growing it. I just love that. My my, my dad is now, well, I, well, I'm 53 and my dad's 80. He'll be 81 here in August and still gets up every morning and goes to that shop. Hmm. And, you know, uh, a lot of people say he's he's the greatest salesman. I mean, he'll take any time out of his day to sit down and talk to anybody that's that is interested in his culture, and you know, he just he just carries on. And I think he also, you know, this is another wonderful thing about what I do and what he does. Is I think it gives you a purpose. You know, you you don't want this culture to fade away. You want to keep people involved, and I think that gives him a purpose and it keeps him young. Yeah. You know? Yeah, you always hear stories about folks who who retire and then they kick the bucket a few years later. You know, I think there's something to be said about having something to to hold on to and be a part of. And I'm sure that he has hundreds, if not thousands of of friends in it, too, that that can check in with him and and talk with him and people that he can reach out to, you know, let alone the the customers that he's working with and helping out. Yeah. And, you know, and what? It's kind of a sidebar, but it, it goes right along with this. You know, there there was a time in my life where my dad and I weren't the closest of friends, but the honorable company of Horners and the love for this culture ha- has given us purpose and drawn us together. You know, when I mm-hmm. finally showed when I when I won the ribbon at Dixon's, uh, I I took the cup and the box, and I took it down to my dad and I showed him, and he he reached into his desk drawer. And he pulled out this little piece of cow horn and it was that first piece of horn I ever engraved. He saved it all those years. And he says, I think it's time you have this back. Wow. And that, that snowballed into him coming to the Horners conference with me and watching, you know, me interact with that great family of people. And he sat me, you know, I, I finally got to take a break and we sat down to have lunch and he put his arm around my shoulder and he's like, son, it's obvious the amount of respect these people have for you, and it makes me proud. Thank you for carrying on the tradition. Yeah. Wow, that's got to mean a lot, man. That's that's just wonderful. It, it's I, again, I, I can't speak enough about this culture and the things that have come out of it. And I just i i don't I don't ever see myself quitting. Yeah, any part of this. Yeah, that's. I can't either. <laughs> like, I, there was a time where you know going to school and you think that there's, you know, different things out there and I, you know, kind of got away with it or got away from it and came back into it. I just can't imagine leaving, you know, the, the people are great. There's always something to learn and something to find out and something to kind of rediscover for myself. Not that it's not been discovered or talked about, but I've just been going through, I've been going through, um, like the accoutrements books and just kind of understanding just kind of the wide variety of topics discussed and, and, photographed in there and just I found this neat little pouch this little striker pouch but I mean I I can't imagine it was more than you know four by four inches and it was leather and stitched on on either side but along the bottom it had been cut and a striker had been sewn into the bottom of the of the pouch so that you had a a tender pouch with your striker all the time you couldn't lose the two you couldn't separate the two and that was just something just super neat that I just thought, well, that's something I've got to figure out and and try to understand how well this worked. You know, there's always something for you to, to dive into. Well, in, in, in using that pouch, I think, I think that's what this, this family of people in this culture does. I think it, I think it winds the two of it, the, it, it winds history and people together the same as that striker in that pouch, you know, where it's inseparable. Yeah. Once, once, once you've experienced it and once you've seen what it, what it can do for you, both historically and through knowledge, it, it, it just, you're one and the same, you yeah. know? Um, 
it, my dad introduced me to so many people over the years. I mean, in today's day and age with, you know, uh, screening phone calls and answering machines and, you know, cell phones, uh, there, every, every time my phone rings and I look at it, if I'm in the shop there, anybody that's been involved in this culture, I, I don't ignore the call. I pick it up immediately because it's so good to hear from them or talk to them. And, you know, it's not only about doing business. It's also about, Hey, you know, what are you working on? Yeah. You know, that's something I love about the going to shows and events is being able to catch up with those people because mm-hmm. everybody's always out there working on something, you know, and when you get to a show, it's kind of, you know, like a debut or, or like a sneak preview of something right. that somebody's working on that you've, you've either heard about or maybe seen some pictures, but you can right. finally see it in person and, and get hands on with it. I mean, it's like, a, you know, e- each each fall or around Christmas, there's a, there's a new phone or a new widget, you know, in kind of <laughs> right. contemporary culture. But when you get into this side of things too, these fall events are, or the, in the like really late summer now that we're getting into it. Um, it's kind of the same thing. It's, Oh, what's, what's so-and-so been working on. I can't wait to see it. Oh, and just, you know, watching the shows continue, you know, even though mm-hmm. adversity hits, I mean, the honorable company of Horners, we lost our venue at, at, uh, at the army heritage and education center, but you know, we we found a, a new venue at Altoona just to continue the event. Um, the the artisan show at Lewisburg. You know, they had they came across the same thing. They lost their venue because they, they sold the country cover. Well, they now in fact they searched until they found a place to continue also near Altoona. That's you know, great. And I guess that kind of segues into you know one of the other things we're going to talk about here. But you know, after 37 years uh, of having an event at Dixon's Muzzleloading Shop. We, the Gunmaker's Fair was no more. This podcast is brought to you by Thor Bullets. Thor Bullets are a premium full bore muzzleloader bullet designed specifically for modern inline rifles. Thor Bullets do not require plastic sabos or belts to be fired, meaning less cleaning for you between shots. The patented copper base creates an airtight seal, giving you greater distance and accuracy. Thor's unique engineering allows the bullets to retain 95% of their weight upon impact, and the controlled expansion ensures large, easy-to-follow blood trails. Thor bullets are currently available in a 50 caliber version that is sized to your specific bore. Thor is also expanding into a new 45 caliber bullet designed for faster 1 in 24 and 1 in 22 twist inline rifles. For more information on these great bullets, visit www.thorbullets.com. We'd like to thank Thor Bullets for their sponsorship of this podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Muzzleloader Magazine, the publication for traditional black powder shooters. Since 1974, Muzzleloader has been the leading magazine devoted to traditional black powder hunting and shooting. Each issue is jam-packed with articles on hunting, shooting, gunsmithing, do-it-yourself projects, living history, American history, book and product reviews, and much, much more. Muzzleloader Magazine is the best traditional muzzleloading magazine, bar none. I'd like to thank Jason at Muzzleloader Magazine for his continued support of I Love Muzzleloading and the I Love Muzzleloading podcast. I don't care what you're into. If you're interested in muzzleloading, this is the kind of magazine I think you need to check out. I've been a fan of Muzzleloader Magazine even before the sponsorship. Uh, I've always been impressed with what Jason has been able to put out with Muzzleloader Magazine, and it really means a lot for him uh, to be supporting I Love Muzzleloading and our efforts over here. Thank you, Muzzleloader Magazine, for your support. That news really hit hard for a lot of people. I, I was never able to make it out to to the show at Dixon's, but I just saw how people were impacted with that news, you know, and, and you know, no hard feelings to the Dixons. I mean, they've been putting on that show and putting in the work to make that happen. You know, right. sometimes the time comes where you've got to change how you're doing things, but that really stung for a lot of people to, to see that go away. I remember as a kid going to the shop, my dad would go there before he had his own shop. You know, we would go there and we would buy flints and patches and, you know, we'd sit and talk to Chuck, you know, back in the, all, all the kids, Greg and everybody else, we were so young, you know, mm-hmm. but I just, I just soaked it up. And then over the years to be able to go there from, you know, I think I've been to all but five of, of those years that they've, they've had that. I, I uh, also went with Bill Kennedy when he was doing lost wax casting in the lower tent and I was his gopher, you know, I'd go get him water, or, you know, I'd help him hold this or do that. And it was for a young kid to experience all that. And then, years later to be able to be part of that, that that was pretty special 
you know. So what went on then? You know, we talked about the the Dixons announcing that they're they're kind of done with the show, and now here a couple years later, we have the Gunmakers Fair at Kempton. Yeah, so that was that was kind of a, a stroke of genius, if you will, and, and and that's to give everybody credit involved. So 2021, the decision was made by uh, Greg and Brenda and the and the crew at Dixon's to you know not have the event, the Gunmakers Fair. So the NMLRA, the Honorable Company of Horners, uh, Pennsylvania Federation of Black Powder Shooters, and Jacobsburg Historical Society. We contacted each other, and at that time, I was the guild master of the HCA, so I was involved at the forefront. We, we all got together, the heads of those organizations, we got together and decided we didn't want, we didn't want this tradition, this culture to, to fade away into nothing. And we decided to make a, an effort to find out how to preserve that. Mm-hmm. So in the months that followed, several uh, video meetings and a lot of phone calls. We we found a place at the uh, Kempton Community and Recreation Center in Kempton, Pennsylvania, which is only like three and a half miles away from where it took place for 37 years. And we went down for a site visit, approached them, and started laying the groundwork for this event. And I mean, so it's been, well, what was it? In February or March of 2021, we knew. And now here we are. Uh, six days away from me traveling down there to set up and do this event. So it, it's been a long road, but you know, what, what it's going to do is to carry on the tradition and values set forth by that Dixon family. And we're so ever grateful for their preservation of the muzzling rifle culture. It's not just a hobby for us. It's a preservation of history in, in learning the schools of rifle building and horn work and graving redware textile living history and i mean just so much more that you could think of yeah um, we're going to continue the the accoutrements judging and and uh gun makers uh competitions i say competitions but it's really not you're, you're not one pitted against the other there's no first second and third place here um if if your work is of the caliber and quality that you know that these panel of judges are looking for you receive every single entry could receive a judge's choice ribbon if it's that quality of work. But the, the most invaluable part of that is that critique sheet, yeah. just that evaluation to help you carry yourself forward. Um, we're also going to be continuing the seminars and demonstrations. Uh, there's three blacksmiths that are going to be setting up showing various aspects of, of blacksmithing, you know, throughout, you know, the, the 18th and 19th century. Um seminars on just about anything you can think of and in, including uh ladies and 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 kids crafts so it, it's not to segregate any gender but it's those 18th and 19th century skill sets that you know maybe a lady was interested in forging but also you know a lady would also know how to do that weaving and the stitching and the cookery and you know so all of that's going to be included yeah, it's important to represent all of the skills and the traditions of the time because they all played into they all played into it. I mean, it's it's easy to hone in and, and focus on one area, but like you say, each of the, the the textiles and the stitching and the weaving, those all play into it as well. And while they were absolutely you know traditionally women's trades in some aspects, you know that's not the case anymore. And it's right. it's great to still have those at events. And I have to say, I'm so happy to hear you mention having kids activities and, and things for kids, because I think that is really important. I don't think we see that enough at no, events. We don't. And, and, and that's the that's the future of this culture or is it the children. And I mean, it, it, in many different aspects of the modern world, I can see people are aging out. You know, they're just losing the interest or they just don't. They don't physically have the ability to do what these kids can do. Um, I, I really, I give a, a shout out and a pat on the back to Eric Bornman, and, and I watched him teach his daughters how to build guns and horns. Yeah, it's, it's amazing to see that continuing. And you know, I, I guess I would say that it's all steeped in tradition, and and I would like to, you know, put our mission out there. I mean, we we have a mission statement on our website. And our mission is to preserve and present the art and industry of making early American muzzleloading firearms and accoutrements. 
bringing together artisans and craftspeople that help create and support the gun making industry, promote muzzle loading by giving seminars on topics such as gun making, horn making, bag making, gun collecting, match competition, hunting, historical reenactments, and other educational based programs. That last piece, educational based programs, to me, that's what Dixon's has always been. That's what the gun makers fair at Kempton is going to be a preservation and education of this culture. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's just so important and I'm, I'm so happy about it. I'm excited to, to be able to come out and, and see the event and, and be there. I'm, I just, I think it's going to be really great. <laughs> I'm, I'm really excited. My, my, my father just asked me today, he's like, it's getting close. And I'm like, it's six days away. And he's like, well, when's the actual event? I'm like, July 29, 30 and 31. He's like, well, how are you doing? And I said, on the outside, I, I have my business hat on and I'm, I'm ready to get to work. On the inside, I'm like a fireworks finale. <laughs> I'm just, I am just bursting with pride and, and honor that we get to do this, you know, and, and all, everybody from those organizations that's involved, including volunteers is just have been amazing. And I think will be amazing. I think this is something that can continue on for many years to come. Yeah. So it, it's not on our questions list that I, I sent you before, but I get a lot of questions about events uh, from people around the country that, that want to find events or are interested in, in maybe starting an event, you know, not to, to crack, you know, not to necessarily see how the sausage is made, but could you mm-hmm. talk a little bit about what it takes to organize an event like this? I mean, you've got a lot of different groups participating in here, but I think that might give a little insight to people who are, might be in an area where they don't have events and are maybe looking to, to start something to, to get this going in their area? Well, first you have to know who's willing to be involved. Um, once you know that you have to find a site that's going to meet your needs. And, uh, that, that could be very, very difficult. Um, because you, one, you have to have room for indoor artisans, outdoor artisans, um, obviously facilities to handle the crowd that's going to come through room for camping and parking, um, tables, chairs, you have to provide food. Uh, all of this could be a logistical nightmare. Luckily, you know, we have a a lot of really involved people that have been doing this for many, many years. And we reach out to these resources and and you're able to put them together, but then it, it takes phone calls, um, numerous, numerous phone calls. Um, it takes advertising. It, It takes money. And, you know, where, where do you get the money to put on this event? Um, not to dwell too long on that because that's not that's not the most important feature. But in order to get that money, you look for sponsors. Um, you also determine what you're going to sell tables for to your vendors. You don't want the price to be so much that they think they can't make their money back. And what do you do with the money after? We're not looking for a profit here. Um, so each organization made an investment in the beginning to secure the grounds. Um you know, we, we, you also have to have insurance, um, liability insurance. You need to be an educational based nonprofit entity. Um, right now it's four organizations that are all nonprofit working together and you have to literally promote this thing month by month by month throughout the entire year to keep people's interest. That includes also the developing of a website, social media pages, reaching out to newspapers, printing flyers, um, all, all the money that has been invested so far is going to be in an operating budget and anything that's left over will be an operating budget for the following year, plus to pay back those organizations, the money they invested. Um, when it becomes to the point where you see that there's money left over, well, then you, you use that money for educational programs to gift it to the community that has a, a muzzleloading culture program to a museum that's pr- promoting, you know, something that you, you use it not only as a venue to bring all these people together, but also to continue it outside of there throughout the year. I think it's interesting now that we're as you know, I think the Internet becomes more and more utilized by the community. We're seeing that thought exactly play out, whereas, you know, traditionally 10, 15, 20 years ago, an event existed maybe the the month before or the week before the event happened. Right. 
and then when the right. event happened and now you're seeing oh. with so much there's so much competition on on what people are doing you know everybody's mm-hmm. everybody has limited time to be able to do something and i think now you're starting to see muzzleloading events and things uh, really be active through the year one so that they keep people engaged you know you can keep people coming back but also to just keep the hobby and the community and the the history the research keep it all going you know and i think that's really exciting to see it become more of a part of our lives as it grows absolutely and it takes that commitment i mean time time is more than money at this point you know every individual is involved you know this is time taken out of their personal lives yeah you know to, to continue this and to make this happen and i personally want to thank every one of them and will constantly do that um jim fulmer is our site director and i, I can't tell you the countless hours that we've been on the phone together and dave eric and frank willis and amy goulart and al picotti i mean all these people that are involved are just investing so much time i mean it, it, once a month there might be a two-hour meeting but outside of that meeting, there's a volume of emails and phone calls that doesn't doesn't cease. And if you don't do that, if you don't communicate like that and you don't come together like that, then the event doesn't happen. Yeah. You know? And that and that has to there that you have to develop a, a continued interest in that and always have people willing to, to do that, to have that core group of people to do that. It takes a lot of work to get something like this going. Absolutely. So what can people expect to see at the Gunmakers Fair at Kempton? You know, if, if um, they've never been to Dixon's, don't really have an idea, and uh, they can come down for a day or two, what can they expect? So, again, we're going to continue everything in the same tradition, but I, I think also you're going to see um, not not only entry-level artisans, but you're all gonna, also going to see high-caliber artisans. Everything from gun making to textiles to weaving uh, horn making, uh, blade making, artistry. Uh, Kevin McDonald, Bob Albrecht, a local a local gallery, the Dan Chris Gallery, is going to be there from Kempton. He's a wildlife and history artist. Um, Selinda Kennedy Redware. Uh, I mean, all of these really, really incredible vendors are going to be there. Uh, Steinhagen Pottery, Powder Horns and more, Gary Mesmer. And he's also doing a seminar on Ashley's return that he was involved in, a fantastic historical event. Um, the the demonstrations, you know, by Paul Hartnaff and and, uh, and Brett Davis and all the blacksmiths, I mean, they're going to be doing barrel forging and, and making lock parts. Uh, you know, there, there's going to be seminars on everything from fine tuning your lock to basic powder horn skills to pouch and bag making. Um, so in a nutshell, seminars, gun makers, artisans, horners, living history, there'll be a living history area and, and vendors of the 18th, 19th century culture. Um, and the ability to come there and really be able to sit and talk to these people and to, to put your item into, into the judging for a critique, um, I think it's going to grow from there. I think we have the ability to to grow from what Dixon's gave us into something more as as long as the the people are interested. Yeah, I think it's I think it's just wonderful. I'm just <laughs> I'm super excited about it, man, because it's it's the kind of event that I I think we need more of. We we need more of these events where somebody can come in and and learn and understand and grow. You know, yes. I think that's, that's a huge opportunity here. And I think that's, that's, you know, just one of the many traditions that you guys are continuing with it. Uh, well, you know, I should plug in there too, that there is going to be food available. The Kempton kitchen is going to have food available and the HCH is, st- is, is also going to be holding their summer reception there. So we're very glad that the, you know, the honorable company owners is, you know, still going to come back and use that as, as a home as they had in the past. Right. Yeah, we. I do. I do have to say though. I mean, we are so very grateful to Dixon's, but we, we want people to understand that this is not associated with the muzzleloading shop. This is a separate event from what it was before. Yeah. And that, that's important to remember. But in in that sense, you know, we we still have to keep in mind that where it started and and you know everything that they've done to get us to this point as well. Right. This whole this whole hobby and the whole community is is really centered around respecting and, and understanding that history. And I think that this is the kind of natural change that we expect to see, you know, over time. 
Yeah, sure. Well, so let me throw the dates out there. Yeah. So it's July 29, 30, and 31. It's open to the public uh, on Friday, July 29th, and Saturday, July 30th from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., and Sunday, July 31st from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Admission is $5 per person, and 15 and under are, are free admission. Um, it'll be at 83 Community Center Drive, Kempton, Pennsylvania which is only approximately three to five miles past where Dixon's mobile loading shop was. If you have any questions whatsoever, you can contact Jim Fulmer or myself, or you can email gunmakersfair at yahoo.com. That's G-U-N-M-A-K-E-R-S-F-A-I-R at yahoo.com. And we'll have links and all of this information in the show notes for the episode, as well as ilovemuzzleloading.com. So if you did not write it down, you can find it there and get out to the show. I would like to say that I promise everybody that, that comes to this event, if it's just a visit uh, for a day or to stay for three days to try to see it all, you will have a great time. I promise you that everybody that's involved in this event will take the time to answer your questions, no matter what they are, or will find you an answer to the questions that you have. If you're also interested in being a vendor in the following years, we are going to do a waiting list. Um, so please let us know if you're interested and we'll make sure we get in contact with you. Well, shoot, man. Is there anything else that you'd like to talk about? I don't know. Again, I'm just, I'm so excited for this event. It, it's just, it, it's, it's been a lot of work and a long road, but it's so fulfilling just yeah. to see it all come together. And I just said to my wife last night, holy cow, it's getting real. Yeah. It's like six days away and I haven't even packed the car yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, uh, I just, I appreciate you, you know, taking the time to let us promote the event and talk about myself a little bit. Um, again, everybody from my past to my future is, is, is I owe a debt of gratitude and thanks. And, you know, I, I hope that, uh, what we do here is in the traditions of old and that we can fill those, those big shoes and moccasins that everybody else wore. That's what it's all about, man. Well, John, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me this evening. I, I can't thank you enough, and I'm so excited about the Gunmakers Fair at Kempton. Well, on behalf of, you know, the National Muzzling Rifle Association, Honorable Company of Horners, Jacobsburg Historical Society, and the Pennsylvania Federation of Black Powder Shooters, we thank you as well, and we look forward to uh, seeing everybody at the fair. I'd like to thank John again for coming on to the show. It was a really great conversation. Uh, I really enjoyed catching up with him. I first met John many years ago, but as a young adult, I met him at the Horn Fair just a few years ago. And it was great to be able to reconnect with him. In my first outing to the Honorable Company of Horners annual Horn Fair, John really took me by the hand and, and led me around and introduced me to people and made sure that I saw the things saw all the things, really, that the Horn Guild and the Honorable Company of Horners had to offer. You know, they always say it's not just about powder horns. And really, as much as it is about horn work and the associated accoutrements, it's it's really about the people. And I think that's the kind of thing that you'll notice if you get out and get involved with an organization like the Honorable Company of Horners or with the event that's going on at the Gunmakers Fair at Kempton. You're really going to find a community and some new friends that are going to be there to, to guide you and help you in your muzzleloading journey. And if nothing else, point you in the direction that you want to go. I know sometimes I get stuck in my own personal research and my own, you know, muzzle loading journey here. And there's always somebody at an event like this, even if they're a total stranger, that's willing to, to answer some of your questions and guide you, point you to where you need to go and, and make sure you're taking the best foot forward. So again, I really appreciate you, John. Thank you so much. Thank you to the team behind the Gunmakers Fair at Kempton. I'm going to have all the information that John talked about, about the show, about the associated associations to the Gunmakers Fair at Kempton and about John's work in the description for this episode. There'll also be a full write-up at ilovemuzzleloading.com slash podcast to go along with this episode where you can find all the information you need to learn about John, his work, and the Gunmakers Fair at Kempton. If you're going to be at the Gunmakers Fair at Kempton, I will be there at least Friday and Saturday. Please stop me and, and talk to me a little bit about uh, about your journey in muzzleloading. I'd love to hear from you and hear about what muzzleloading is like for you. It's helping me kind of continue my research here. 
into the community and, and what it's all about, I would love to hear from you uh, about the muzzleloading community, about your muzzleloading journey. Uh, it's a great opportunity, too. If you have anything, I always ask people, you know, uh, what do you like and what do you don't like about about the content that we're putting out there, about the videos and things? You know, I am uh, I can take a critique and I'd, I'd love to hear what you have to say. So, you know, if you if you're going to be there, you know, maybe think about some things that you'd like to see more of or, or maybe see less of. Uh, it really helps me kind of figure out what I need to be doing with the videos and with the interviews that we're that we're talking about here um, really helps me try to make the best that I can for the sport and for the community and, and for the members of the community. I'm always trying to improve and, and hearing your feedback really helps me out. I know in the last few episodes, I've had a lot of podcast feedback come back to me, which was really great. So I appreciate all the feedback that I've gotten so far. And I look forward to hearing more from more of you that are out there. Um, I really appreciate it. And uh, if you're listening to this, you've gotten this far, I really appreciate you listening. And really, if you shut off the episode, even though you're not listening still, I appreciate each and every one of you that uh, that listens and watches and, and writes. And um, it really means a lot that there are people out there interested in seeing Muslim and continue and, and, and be so supportive. I mean, the community itself is just so supportive anyway. Um, it's just a wonderful, it's just wonderful to be a small part of it like we are here. So that's all I have for you this 